The Meg series isn't known for being scientifically accurate. None of these giant animal movies ever are, but Steve Alton followed the old Mark Twain advice of understanding facts before distorting them, resulting in a long-standing series of aquatic horror novels often viewed as some of the best in that particular genre. The film adaptation of The Meg decided a different approach by imitating Amazon's rape of the Silmarillion. And since it made money for the CCP, we must endure this tripe again. Meg 2 The Trench opens with a scene from the trailer, an inferior version from the first book, before picking up a few years after the first movie. Jason Statham returns as Jonas Taylor, investigating a cargo ship dumping toxic waste material into the ocean, as he has become an eco-warrior. After escaping the ship and being scooped up by a plane, he travels to China for a fundraiser hosted by Zhu Ming Zhang, the oddly absent Su Yin's never-before-mentioned brother and now owner of Zhang Oceanic, the Mana One facility, and a coastal reserve in Hainan. Jonas notices an obvious villain giving him the stink eye before Zhu Ming and his major financier, Hillary, reveal new technology, the Meg they have in captivity named Haiki, and that Suyin is dead. And no, there is no explanation. The next day at the reserve, Zhu Ming decides to hop in the holding pen as he believes he's trained Haiki, which almost results in him being eaten. The next day, most of the returning cast, including Jonas's friend Mac, Suyin's daughter Mei Ying, and the annoying DJ travel to Mana One in preparation for an exploratory dive into the Marianas Trench while Haiki has escaped the reserve in the night. The following morning, Mac and DJ stay behind while Jonas, Ju Ming, and some disposable extras descend into the depths, during which the already annoying Mei Ying comes out of the floor, and despite Jonas's chagrin, Ju Ming decides the dive should continue. Suddenly, Haiki appears, and the two subs breach into the thermocline to evade her. Despite previous explanations why Megs couldn't enter the thermocline, Haiki goes through it anyway and draws the attention of two larger Megs, and yet again, Juming decides not to return to Mana One. In their pursuit of the Megs who begin a mating ritual, they discover a mining operation. The obvious villain from the fundraiser, Montez, who may as well be a member of the Aqua Sharks, spots them and decides not to return to base, call for help, or to scare off the twin subs. Instead, he detonates explosives, killing his co-workers and causes an avalanche that entraps him, Jonas, and company. Fantastic, this is Game of Thrones Season 8 writing. After the avalanche, Jonas and everyone decide the only chance of survival is to equip experimental exosuits and walk three miles to the mining facility. Along the way, the cannon gets foddered by a meg, a fucking kraken, and they fight off the dinosaurs from the opening. In the facility, the survivors find more of Zhu Ming's exosuits and are trapped by a mole remotely working on Mana One. The mole, Jess, works for Hillary, who organized this operation and stole Zhu Ming's designs. After monologuing, the room they're in begins flooding, and Jonas, fuck water pressure Taylor, fills his lungs with water and swims without an exosuit at the bottom of the Marianas Trench to the other side of the facility to unlock the door and save the others. He reaches the other side, but passed out, and then Montez saves Jonas so he can fight him and monologues as well about being his arch enemy. Except, and I'm not kidding, Jonas doesn't remember him. So after beating Montez down and saving the others, they escape the facility before it implodes. But Montez grabs an inflatable buoy and rockets to the surface. On Mana 1, Jess has taken over with the mercenaries, all of whom get devoured by the now escaped Megs because they decided to chase after Jonas and the others on a boat instead of the fucking helicopter they have. Really proving you guys deserve less money with this top-notch writing, Hollywood. Anyway, Jonas and the company then flee to... <sighs> Fun Island, and prepare to deal with the Megs, which arrive shortly after, along with the dinosaurs, Kraken, Montez, more mercenaries, and Hillary. And then a game of rock, paper, scissors takes place that is so ridiculous it would make Mega Man's head spin. Follow me here. Jonas beats Meg. Meg beats Kraken and Montez. 
Kraken beats Bomb, Bomb beats Dinosaur, Dinosaur beats Mercenaries and Hillary, and Dana White beats his wife. By the end of this last chaotic 30 minutes of movie, the two extra Megs are dead, the Kraken is Calamari, Hillary, Montez, and the Mercenaries are all gone, Heike, presumably Pregernant, escapes, and the heroes celebrate their victory on the beach. Even though the imploded facility has left a gigantic hole in the thermocline that anything can escape from. There are so many problems in the Meg 2 that I could have live streamed for two or more hours and probably not have covered everything wrong with it. As you've picked up, the story makes little sense, and if you, like I, are a fan of the novels, you understand this film decided wiping its ass with the book wasn't enough and had taken the extra steps of approaching science and believability like a Marxist does history. Let's start with the cast. Statham has less passion than a post-breakup wank. If he isn't throwing hands, he stands around being ignored for telling stupid people, their bad ideas are bad. Cliff Curtis is wasted as Mac, looking and acting like someone scraped him off a park bench since his role is so small he could have been played by a broom handle for all the difference it would make. It is nice to see Wu Jing again, recognized him from Killzone, but his presence is redundant as the Chinese Jason Statham, with more money and hair. He survives multiple explosions, the avalanche, the little dinosaurs, and the kraken. The man has an armor class of 20. The the worst character in the film is Mei Ying. For comparison, people mocked Amazing Spider-Man 2 because Gwen repeatedly puts herself in dangerous situations and she becomes a burden for Peter in battle. That's Mei Ying. I find it difficult to believe the writers thought a giant octopus, multiple megalodon, a pack of small dinosaurs, and the crushing depths of the Pacific Ocean weren't enough of a threat they felt like hindering the cast with her worthless ass. Now, if you've seen the first Meg, you've noticed some characters are missing. Jax the Technician and Lori, Jonas's ex-wife. They probably read the script and decided to dodge this bullet like Wesley Snipes did his taxes. Now, I'm at a loss with Li Bingbing as Su Yin, Jonas's love interest. Unless she sneezed in Xi Jinping's direction, I genuinely have no idea why she's missing, besides the bullshit she died between movies excuse. Her absence is felt as multiple scenes had her in mind, but were hastily rewritten to fit Ju Ming. For example, the little bit banter specific to Su Yin and Jonas is spoken between Jonas and Ju Ming instead, and it feels way out of place. There are many odd or nonsensical writing issues. Despite the threat of three Megs, Ju Ming orders the dive to continue. Hillary risks her entire scheme by having Montez at the fundraiser. The animals show up at the exact same locations, and they're inconsistent, often doing the opposite of what people say they will. Jonas disallows the use of the motor on the boat so as not to attract the Meg, but the mercenaries stop using their motor and get eaten anyway. Anyway, and then Jonas says, fuck it, and they use the motor to speed off. The villains literally defeat themselves. Montez saves Jonas just to get knocked around like Forrest Griffin fighting Anderson Silva. Later on, he's got Jonas dead to rights, but practically allows Jonas to kick him into the Meg like he was a Persian messenger. Hillary is safe inside a helicopter from the now amphibious dinosaurs until she walks out. And yes, you heard me correctly, the now amphibious dinosaurs. 65 million years of evolution, and they look the same and can roar because they possess both lungs and gills. Weird how they changed, but nothing else did. The Meg in the novel are visually scary, having pale ghostly green skin and bioluminescence, which makes for a horrifying visual during the night scenes. In the movies, they're just big sharks, and to compensate, one of them looks tough enough to enter the salty spittoon. Also, the creatures mean nothing. Thing? I've used hole punchers with more impact than the existence of these animals in this world. Several years after its predecessor, and I'm in disbelief at the almost uncaring reaction to these circumstances. I suppose laziness is the answer, but I could have written an entire script of unanswered questions and left it at that. How did Mei Ying sneak on board the sub? How do the two parties escape their buried submersibles? How did Zhu Ming catch Haiki? How are there no other major organizations, public or otherwise, attempting to enter the trench. None of these get answered.
answered, leaving me more confused than Winona Ryder getting an award. It's like the writers watched an episode of Sesame Street and learned the word convenience. Mei Ying just so happens to have one of these brand new exosuits in her size. Montez, riding the buoy, reaches the surface right next to Mana 1, and Heike exclusively attacks the giant octopus. It's like the writers met, then stuffed their ideas into a cannon, fired it at the wall, and went with whatever stuck. So, there you have it. Yet another terrible shark movie to cast into the depths. This is the Ant-Man 3 of shark movies, and I almost refuse to believe Steve Alton has allowed his flagship series to be desecrated like this. But I guess the desperation from years of development hell will do that to someone, and these movies should serve as a warning for you not to allow people who lack talent or passion to take possession of the fruits of your passion and talent. Now thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.